Versus is a cognitive computing company as opposed to an artificial intelligence company. Our main focus is not to try to artificially engineer intelligence in a computer, but rather to take the best of what we understand about biology, physics, and neuroscience and apply that to computing, distributed computing, which we believe will be driven by the edge, and fundamentally building a fabric based on science and standards to connect people, places, and things uh, to enable this new digital infrastructure for the 21st century. Well, I think the lens that, that I look through is, is the lens of the convergence of all of these technologies. So you have artificial intelligence or intelligent agents that are kind of the new logic layer. Those replace the apps of today. You have a new immersive interfaces that re replace the, the screens of today. And you have data that is structured in such, such a way that, that AI can understand us and we can understand their decision making process. So what you want is the benefit of these technologies so where they're hyper efficient, therefore sustainable, not the sort of massive data centers, you know, powering the small power of a sun to try to keep some AI powered, but rather many, many billions of small agents at the edge that really make up the new web. I mean, the third version of the web here will be this combination of the technologies that we spend all our time talking about. Spatial computing, augmented and virtual reality as the interface, AR, uh, you know, uh, IA, uh, AI and, and IA, so uh, intelligent agents, artificial intelligence, and new kinds of ways of dealing with data, including things like blockchains and digital currencies. And this kind of becomes the sci-fi future that we've all seen in movies and, and stories. What we want, though, in this 2035 year is a, a version of the future, which we need to start envisioning, that's not about the technology, but how that technology augments our capabilities. How does it make us smarter? Right? How does it make the world safer? and more sustainable. So I think it is that sci-fi future, but we've yet to dream the dream of what a good future with great technology looks like. So I think that that's what these types of conversations are about. And um, uh, that's the world that I see in the future. I think we all have two feelings when we try to imagine this future with 100 billion sensors out there. The first one, when we just do a little bit of forecasting is, okay, everything that can be tracked will be tracked. And then you think, well, that's a, that sounds horrible. Why would I want that? I don't want that. And we, we have this you know, re repulsion. As much as we're attracted to these technologies, we imagine these you know, amazing utopian scenarios, how personalized healthcare or how to tackle planet scale problems, things beyond the limits of our cognition and even beyond the, the ability of our collective cognition. That's, that's why we come to places like this, is to learn from each other and to talk to each other and to, to imagine new futures. But the more capability we give these systems, the more autonomy we give them, um, w w by, by this I mean the ability to do things without us needing to figure it out, which is what we want. I don't want to tell my autonomous car, stop, make a left, drive. You know, I want it to be autonomous. If you take that and extrapolate that to all of the smart things in the world, right? So we've got smartphones, smart, smart devices, smart homes, smart cars. We want smart buildings, smart hospitals, smart cities. How do you make all these smart things work together if everyone's going to build their own smart way to do it, right? And it turns out, with the last 30 years of technology, we have developed interoperability for communication between data systems, but we have not developed uh, interoperability for the data itself. Everyone's got their own format, schema, style, uh, and, and, and anyone who, who's ever tried to stick two pieces of data, like sensor data and spatial information with legacy data, knows that this is, this is the problem. So what is the solution today? Make a magic box, use deep learning, get as many NVIDIA computers as possible, um, get a hundred million dollars and crank the thing for four or five months and hopefully some answers will pop out. What are the answers? How did it arrive at those answers? Eh, black box, we don't know. So, but we don't want to put autonomous agents into the world that will be 10 times more than the total number of humans operating every device and every environment in our homes, in our schools, in our streets, in our bodies without the ability to not just have deep learning, but to have deep understanding. That means that they need to understand us, the data that we produce. You said data fusion. 
sensor fusion, data fusion, these are terms you may not think of very much. You, you, you are one of the world's experts on this topic. I am building the, the HoloLens. But today, as you're sitting in this room, you're fusing all this different data together. You're sensing the temperature of the room. Your eyes are seeing us on the stage. You're hearing my voice. And you can produce this full simulation in your brain, full three-dimensional model. We need the ability to produce this in these systems. So we've been working with the IEEE, who standardized Wi-Fi and Ethernet and Bluetooth and things that we rely on today to enable a new global standard for data interoperability that enables spatial information, physical data from sensors, um, historical data to basically be fused together in any way, like Lego pieces, in a completely explicit and explainable model, much like we did for the World Wide Web, like we've done for other protocols, but now to allow the data to be combined, to be auditable, to be permissionable. And this is the kind of digital infrastructure fabric upon which we can enable then intelligence at the edge with enabling agents that are law abiding, right? That can understand our ethics and our, our values. And so I think that this is the, the shift that we have to move towards. We have to think of this as a new global network, the third version of the web. And we need to build out that data infrastructure that enables um, all the benefits that we want in these, these smart cities of the future where at the very least, all these smart things should work together. So the, the idea of geospatial, we're all quite familiar with. We've all got GPS you know, navigators in our phones. In, in the world that you're talking about, the world that analog is building, that, that, that versus and Marantics, and, and, and are we calling it Space 42? Yes. No? Yeah, yeah, about to be Space 42, um, is what we call hyperspatial. What do I mean by that? I mean, instead of just physical dimensions, other dimensions of your life are factored into that journey from point A to point B. So yes, yeah, so maybe the fastest path is most important. And we've all seen when we turn on traffic and we turn off the traffic layer and we get an intelligent sort of capability to route us. But what if you said, well, I want the scenic route, or by the way, it's my, it's my, um, I, I want to pick up a toy for my kid on the way home, figure out which, which the best route to do that. So sometimes it's about efficiency and productivity, but if you move into from geospatial to hyperspatial, context awareness, as you said, well, some of the context is traffic. Some of the context is, you know, whatever those other personal reasons are, you're going to need agents that are your personal agent that are guiding that process using data from public information, real-time data from sensors, your historical data, your emotional state, your hungry, right? And so if you start to think of these infinite number of layers that suddenly get turned off and on by these intelligent agents from the future, you are doing this data fusion, sensor fusion. But as long as you have interoperability at that infrastructure layer, all of a sudden, you really do get that very cool sci-fi future that we want. And if we can do it in ways where we get to permission and control that data, data sovereignty, and this is the new property rights that we need to be fighting for, then that becomes valuable for everybody. And then collective things that we can learn together and share enable this type of collective computing you were talking about upstairs. And I think that the, the idea of starting from a map and adding these infinite layers is a very easy way to start to imagine that future, where some of those layers you maybe you know, are on a screen, but some of them start to be projected into the environment in front of you. So this is a very cool idea that I think starts with geo and grows up from there. How many people in this room feel that the person right next to you has 100% the exact same ethics as you? Please raise your hand. <laughs> or with your spouse <laughs> or best friend. What are we doing when we try to pull down all the data from the web, which represents, I don't know, maybe at best a single digit number of the data that's relevant on the web, meaning most of the data is yours. It's behind a password. It's behind a login. It's your company's data. It's your personal data. Chat GPT or G GPT 2345, all the rest, did not train on that data. They trained on single digit percentage. And yet, what are we getting out of that? The average ethics in a blender. We do not want a world where any company or any country has produced the average ethics in a blender that we try to fine tune. Ask Elon how Grok is going trying to make his AI unwoke. 
it's not working that well. Why? Because it's hard to tune these things because they hallucinate their own stuff. Because what bias is in there is already in there. And you have to perform all these magic tricks to try to get it wrong. So is it going to be a little bit racist? Yeah, because the web's a little bit racist. Is it going to be a little bit sexist? Yeah, it's going to be a little bit sexist. All of the problems that we have, the things that we love and hate about the data on the World Wide Web, the information that we've produced, some of our best and some of our worst of ourselves is all there. But that's not all of us. And that's not you. So the entire concept of a monolithic approach to artificial intelligence, we believe is the exact wrong approach. What you need is intelligence at the edge, your agent, your data, right? And your ethics, your bias, what we want in any democracy is a marketplace of bias. We want lots of bias, all kinds of bias, all kinds of different ethical perspectives. And then we test the fitness of our ideas with each other, right? And in collectives, we vote on these things to, to determine what we want. And then what? We learn what works and doesn't work, and we adapt. But today, we're looking at AI systems by the world's leaders in the space who are making AIs that don't adapt, that are monolithic data systems that are trying to basically produce the average ethics in a blender. You cannot do ethics after the fact this way. You can't do alignment after the fact this way. And you can't do governance after the fact this way. And so it's critically important that we start to think of, like we're doing at Versus, developing ways of de creating intelligent agents that are yours, right? that you can basically put your data into, that you can control that data and how it's used. You can control how it's monetized. That can learn and adapt the way that you learn and adapt, become augmentations of our capabilities, and then connect it together. We have this collective debate about where we want to take the world and what kind of ethics apply. Not all ethics apply in all situations. We, we, we know this very well. So I, the whole concept of AI ethics is, to me, very backwards. It's just ethics. And we don't want AI ethics. We want our ethics. And we want to be able to, to share these together in what I think is a, you know, an entirely distributed architecture, much more like the web and much less like AOL or any of the centralized portals that try to, hey, these are the only websites you can go to. This is how we started. So I believe that the future is just about ethics and bias, and we all have it. So let's all bring it to the table and have the, have the discussions, have the dialectic, and learn from each other. So I believe that that's the shift that, that we need to move forward with in 2024. If you make an AI system that's based on a monolithic data set that tries to learn the world and apply what it learns from the past to the future, but only learns from the past, uh, which is every AI system we're basically talking about today in terms of gen generative AI and deep learning. This is why, this is why we can't get to autonomous cars. They, they, they make mistakes because what isn't in the training data, it can extrapolate. It, there is no magic. There is no emergence. It's, it is amazing and maybe the most, world's most amazing engineering feat. But if we trained it on data 200 years ago, I think slavery was a good idea. Right? And so if you have a monolithic system that is trying to average out whatever the dominant perspectives were in any given culture, it doesn't allow for that culture to grow and adapt, doesn't allow for minority voices to emerge. So you have to have a system that can enable more diverse voices and adapt and change as that goes, which we, we have done as a culture, right? And there's, there's, there's a, a much longer road to go, but I don't think that's the vehicle that can take us there. It has to come from us and it has to basically be authentic to us. And if we don't have adaptation in these systems, which by the way, just so we're super clear, that's what intelligence is. If you can't adapt to a new situation, you're not intelligent in that situation. So your old intelligence doesn't apply. Then that is every system we're talking about. What we're developing at Versus, based on cognitive architectures of how the, how the mind works, how, how biological intelligence works, enables agents to adapt. And so as a society, we have to adapt. So we need to build that adaptation and emergence and support that in the system itself. We can't just take it from the average of whatever the history was before. So I think that this supports and enables and encourages change. Here's a question that we don't ask ourselves. What does digital enforcement look like? Exposure is great. Being aware that it's happening, having conversations about it. How do you stop it from happening? Or if it's happening, how do you determine who gets access to that data and under what terms they can do it? In what law-abiding ways can we ensure enforcement? And so this is part of what we need standards for. We need socio-technical standards that enable governments to be, governance to be automated, for data rights to be automated. And if it's not, you get to shoot it out of the sky. 
You can't just put a satellite up there and spy on everybody, right? We, we've, we've done this with the web. Everyone remember when there was just HTTP and anyone could do anything? We said, oh, let's add certificates. So HTTPS, so we have security, we have TLS certificates, we can authenticate who, who's, oh, is it not Bank of America? Oops, they took my money. We don't want the same thing in the physical world. So we want to apply the lessons we have learned from large network architectures, the largest in the world, to these issues. A lot of ethics comes down to what behaviors can or cannot be done. But if we're merely aware of them, but don't like them, but we can't digitally enforce them, a bunch of Congress people saying it's illegal, is not gonna do anything. We need digital enforcement at the network layer, in the data itself. Global standards that are powering every device in this room, powering these lights, powering these microphones, they are the things that are the quiet infrastructure underneath that we all run on. Engineers and scientists agree, doesn't matter who the prime minister is, doesn't matter who's in Congress, this happens based on does it work or does it not work. We need it at the standards level. Groups like IEEE and ISO need to be leading the charge. They are, we're working with them now. This then allows us to then have different kinds of decisions around data privacy and data sovereignty in different governments and different regions while enabling interoperability, just like we can bring our devices and our plugs here and get little adapters when we roll in. Then both the humans, the sensors, the robots, the devices can all use data in that same way. And we can do this experiment where we learn better and better ways of maintaining our data ownership, our sovereignty, our privacy, and interoperability. And I believe that that opens up this new world that we're looking for. Mm -hmm.